a later effort to put some of the human biology idea into a middle school curriculum in which Craig Heller and, and Mary Kiley uh, had an important role was, was uh, a, a way of kind of extending the vision a little bit, and I thought it was uh, an ambitious and, and, and uh, worthwhile project that I hope will be celebrated some at the reunion. The Hum Bio curriculum, that has, that's an interesting story. Uh, when I was chair, um, you know, I was always a little bit frustrated by the fact that we put all of this effort into organizing this series of core courses every year, and then they disappear. I mean, it's reinvented every year, so it's almost like I remember describing it at one point as ephemeral art. You know, you, you organize it every year, and then it disintegrates and you have to do it all over again next year. And at that time we were discussing why aren't there other human biology programs around the country? And one of the reasons was that it was rare to have the, the diversity of expertise that was represented in our HumBio core and our HumBio program. And not only have that distribution of expertise, but people who work together, cooperate, are happy to, are eager to, to work together to put on a program. So one idea we came up with, well, what if we videotaped, back then it was cassette videotapes, what if we videotaped the whole Humbio core and made those tapes available to other schools? So if a school wanted to have a program in human biology, but they didn't have any anthropologists, we could provide. Uh, lectures in anthropology, and certainly the, the modules as, as unique learning experiences. So uh, at that time, Mary Kiley was a program officer at Carnegie, and I had known her as a student in the department, and a graduate student. And I said to Mary, do you think that Carnegie would be interested in supporting this? And she said, well, I don't know, but I'll go ask David, David Hamburg. And she came back and she said, well, David would really like you to focus on the middle grades. <laughs> and I said, what? I said, we're a university faculty. We don't know anything about teaching middle grades. Neither Craig Keller nor I, I don't know about Mary Kiley, had ever stood in front of a middle school class. We wouldn't know what, how to talk to these kids. And she said, yeah, but David thinks that human biology would really be popular and successful in the middle grades, and that's where the problem resides. We were quite interested in middle grades education because it seemed that, particularly in science, uh, students became disenchanted with studying science after they finished the middle school years, grades roughly six through eight. Some of them come through that experience, go into high school and go on to college, and others are lost to education. And uh, it's the, the issue of education in the middle grades that is the single most contribution that could be made uh, to education in the United States. So we decided that we would go on both fronts, that we would film the undergraduate core in human biology so that it could be disseminated, and also look at having the uh, program in human biology faculty think about how they could distill the core year of sophomore year into a middle grades uh, curriculum. So I said, well, I don't know, but I guess we could try to put at least an outline together of what it might look like, fine. So David gave us a little support for a summer effort to gather people together and outline what a middle grades curriculum in human biology might look like. So we thought, job done. And David Hamburg uh, looked at it, loved it, because he had been a founder of the program in human biology, and said, why don't you talk to Craig again and ask him you know, if he'll just continue on and actually start writing the unit. <laughs> get started. What do you mean? Well, it has to be written. <laughs> so I said, well, you know, once again, we don't do that. Uh, we're not familiar with education at that level. Just, well, you can get help from teachers and schools. And so I said, well, maybe well, we could do one unit just as a sample of what might be done and somebody can pick it up. We were not so presumptuous to feel that we as academics had all the answers. So we brought on educators from middle schools in the area. We went to these schools, we said, this is what we want to do. Do you have some volunteers who will work with us? First rate teachers who care a lot, 
So we worked very closely with a number of schools and teachers in the area and we formed subcommittees, each working on a portion of the core. So we did that first unit and as I recall it was on the circulatory system on the heart and uh, we had fun doing it. Jim Lowry was uh, a lecturer in human bio at the time and he was tremendous in, in helping to put this together. We may have done another unit at that same time and I don't remember uh, if we did or not. It could have been one of Harant or one of Shirley's. So I spent a lot of time in, I wrote three of the, three of the volumes for uh, the, the parts on puberty, sexuality, and uh, human development. I don't even remember now. So we did that and we thought, once again, job over. David says, when are you going to finish the whole project? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, well, we don't have the money for it, and uh, we don't know if we have all of the help. And so actually David and I went to NSF to talk to uh, NSF about funding uh, a major curriculum effort. And they, I think with David's influence, they uh, agreed to do it. So we had, I think it was a couple million dollars to, to uh, develop this whole human bio curriculum right here behind me. And the idea was that, first of all, this would be hands-on activities. Uh, this would be all focused on the human and whenever possible on the adolescent. The idea was that what are kids interested at this stage in their lives? They're interested in themselves. Uh, they're changing more rapidly than, than at any other time in their lives. Since uh, youngsters at this age are interested in the changes that are occurring in their body, they're interested in the uh, widening social sphere and the opposite sex relationships, boy-girl relationships, parties, dating. It's a period of exploration of drugs, alcohol, smoking. So we thought, well, if we teach them things that they're living through this moment, they would get very excited. So we would use that as the hook to get them interested in biology and then through biology, get them interested in uh, uh, writing, get them interested in language arts, get them interested in, in mathematics, uh, get them interested in physics and chemistry and social sciences because it all relates to the study of human biology. And we not only had the biological science, the physiology, the anatomy, the brain um, and the, all the rest of biology, but we took very seriously the social science component, some of the anthropology, some of the developmental and social psychology. So it was meant to be a core curriculum. So each unit would be about two weeks of work. It would involve team teaching by a group of teachers. They were paperback books because the intent was that the kids would own the books. They'd take them home, they'd use them, and they'd become part of their family life as well. Craig reached out immediately to the School of Education, first to Elizabeth Cohen, who was particularly an expert in looking at heterogeneous classrooms and how you engage all students in learning at a very high level. And he uh, talked with Elizabeth and then Mary Bud Rowe, who had just come to Stanford from the University of Florida, who is one of the uh, nation's top science educators, had also come. And she was very enthusiastic about this project. The uh, Carnegie Corporation uh, were quite wonderful in putting enormous amounts of time, effort, and resources into um, selling, I put that in quotes, selling the program to school districts. They convened educational conferences, they attended conferences of principals, of science teachers. We uh, funded uh, uh, 15 test sites around the country to uh, use these materials, test them out in their classrooms, and they were, they were Tremendous diversity of classes from you know very rural poor schools in the panhandle of Florida to very wealthy schools in Hillsboro, uh, California, uh, inner city schools, uh, urban, suburban, everything. So we had quite a diversity of, of field tests, even a parochial school in Texas. Since the centerpiece of human biology was evolution, clearly a centerpiece of the materials that we prepared for the middle school curriculum was uh, evolution. Uh, 
Now, every, not every school district wanted to have a text where the centerpiece was evolution. Uh, I, I will tell you a little bit of an experience that I had when we were at the end of this project and we were close to publishing it. Um, I got called to Washington, to NSF, uh, to talk to people high in the division that had funded the project. And I thought, well, this is great. They're going to give us all sorts of congratulations for a job well done. Behind closed doors, I was told to bury the unit on sex and the unit on evolution. <laughs> I said, no, thank you. <laughs> the money's been spent. They're going to be published. Nothing you can do about it. If we had gone to high schools and say, you know, we will give you money if you teach human sexuality. They wouldn't. Even in the school systems that really liked what we had done in the biological component, they said, we think we'll take these five books on the biology, but we don't want to have all that social sci psychology stuff. So what happened to it? Well, the NSF required us to have a publisher. So we did get Addison Wesley as being our uh, publisher. And just about the time we finished the manuscripts, Addison Wesley sold their innovative publishing division and they no longer existed. So we had to get a new publisher. So we got a small company uh, associated with the Chicago Tribune uh, called Everyday Learning. Everyday Learning was uh, publishing at that time in elementary math predominantly and uh, this was their opportunity to move into the middle grades. They were very enthusiastic, they were very good to work with, and they actually did the publications of what you see, what you see here. But before it was done, they were bought up by a big textbook company that was not at all interested in innovative uh, materials. They wanted the meat and potatoes biology texts that don't have sex and don't have evolution and could be sold in <laughs> states that favor a more, much more conservative curriculum. Teaching evolution and teaching uh, reproductive biology were the two main objections at the junior high level and even the high school level throughout the country. So um, it's, uh, it was a struggle. The way that these companies could really make money was by selling textbooks and getting on the state adoption list. So it's 30 some, 30 some of the states have state adoption so that you have to be approved by the state adoption board in order to be purchased by the school district. Hmm. So um, yeah, the, the company that, that, that bought up the rights just buried it. Make it up as we go along. Feet on the, ground. the intent was that if we're putting out this curriculum, we'd also have to educate the teachers. So what better way to educate the teachers than to give them access to our core courses? So this original idea of taping the core to make it available to other universities then got changed into taping the core to make it available for teacher education for the teachers who might want to use the Humbio curriculum. So every, we taped every single lecture so we, we actually, this was before the earthquake, we remodeled the geo corner so that it was a, essentially a production studio. There were lights and there were positions for four cameras and every one of the lectures in the core that year uh, was filmed for camera angles. It's not our biological tendencies to aggression which are probably the biggest problem that we face. Instead, it's our cultural, our cultural abilities to shape those tendencies, to use them in ways for which they were not intended biologically, and most importantly, our ability to rationalize our use of aggression. Uh, that constitutes perhaps uh, the biggest problem that aggressive behavior presents for Homo sapiens. And I did an introduction and a conclusion for each of them. So it was a huge effort. <laughs> and it it's never hard. got used. Yeah. Nice and then, of course, the earthquake destroyed that lecture hall. <laughs> yeah. a, I remember I was, I was in the quad at the time the earthquake struck in, in 1989. I was actually in the president's office, and uh, 
So we went out of the president's office into the quad, and I remember the palm trees going whop, 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 whop. And so there was a lady standing next to me, I remember. She said, oh, I'm so scared my knees are shaking. I said, no, they're not. The ground's moving. <laughs> well, <laughs> somebody reminded me of, of something that happened at that time, uh, that apparently just before the earthquake, uh, we had managed to get funds to buy some computers that sounds so trivial now, but back then it was a big deal to get some computers for for Humbayo so that they'd be available for students to use and so forth. And and someone told me that they remember me running into the Humbayo office immediately after the earthquake to make sure that the computers weren't damaged. <laughs> so. Head in the sky. We eventually asked for, I, I, on behalf of the Office of Technology Licensing, we asked for our portion, well, their portion of the copyright back. We had joint copyright with Everyday Learning Corporation, and then McGraw-Hill uh, became the owner of that upon the sale of Everyday Learning to McGraw-Hill companies. And it took over a year before the attorneys actually um, you know, handed over the copyright fully to Stanford University Board of Trustees. And I think it was clearly, they didn't want anything, they just wanted to hold us off as long as possible. <laughs> but at least they did it, which was great. And now we're able to use the curriculum in any way we want. We always kept the, the multimedia version of the, of the digital version of the curriculum. Anything we did in the digital world was always Stanford. And now these materials are being developed by a non-profit foundation, CK12, uh, to be put on the web so that any school, any teacher can use them freely. Is that locally? That's locally. Uh, the, the, the founder of the foundation is uh, Nira Kosla, and it uh, is in East Palo Alto. And uh, it specializes in making uh, educational materials of high quality, openly available, free source to anybody who wants to use them. I think some of the materials are already out there, available. And what CK12 does is it gives teachers the ability to assemble, if you will, their own books. So they can take bits and pieces from here or there and put it together. But as with almost all important uh, social problems, there are political and ideological obstacles. And uh, they had to fight their way pretty hard to do what they did in that uh, program and I, I think they deserve a lot of credit for that.